I want to take all of you on a little bit of a world tour uh, this afternoon, this evening, this morning, wherever this conversation may find you. But first, Mitch, just to emphasize, uh, you know, your points around my background. So I spent 15 years at the NSA, um, a couple of years running the NSA's counterterrorism operations mission. So think of this you know, as using technical means basically to hack into the devices used by terrorists. This was their smartphones, their tablets, their laptops, all with the goal of reading their email, listening to their phone calls, geolocating them. Uh, and then of course, for our close knit community here, uh, my favorite part of the job, Mitch, which was a uh, kinetic remediation. And we actually get to take those bad guys off of the battlefield. So I did that for a few years between us, a pretty stressful job. And so as a bit of a reward, I got to spend a few years working out of the American embassy in London, helping the British get ready for the 2012 Summer Olympics. Now, of course, we're all laser focused on Paris this summer. I am so excited. But every time the Olympics rolls around, the eyes of both terrorists and hackers get laser focused on those Olympics. And that was certainly true in 2012. <clears throat> now, the British, given their history, very well versed in terrorist plotting, we basically let them handle the terrorist threats. And we, as Americans, took responsibility for the cyber threats to those Olympics. So that was the Chinese trying to hack into the clocks and the timers at the Olympic venues. We had the Russians trying to get into the databases that house the Olympic drug testing records, all kinds of miscreants looking to rub grit in the eyes of the British. I was thrilled to see those games go off without a hitch and to return home, Mitch, to suburban Maryland, which of course is where the NSA is headquartered, to spend my last five years at the NSA in which I would tell this audience really was my dream job. So this was the job that I had wanted from the day that I started at the NSA, and that was running the NSA cyber exploitation operations mission. So think of this as basically our professional American hackers. So in this job, I would go around to top universities and colleges around the United States and try to convince new computer scientists and computer engineers that they didn't want you know, that six figure salary at a big tech company or at a big bank, that rather they wanted to get paid government peanuts to come do something that frankly would be illegal anywhere else. That was my poll, Mitch. I could offer them a chance to no longer be beholden to the Computer Fraud and Abuses Act. And for a particular ilk of young person, you probably know some kids like this, that was a very alluring proposition. So we bring these young folks in, give them 18 months of highly classified training, and then conduct hundreds of operations a day, hacking into the networks of the Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, the Iranians, all with the goal of keeping the United States and her allies safe. Definitely a dream job because as a technologist, like many of us on this call today, I got to work every technology on the planet, including a bunch of things you can't even buy in the United States, things we'd have to have diplomatically pouched in, and also a dream job because I got to lead a team of incredibly talented, and Eric, I will tell you this, incredibly weird patriots. Now, these folks, right, again, folks who were motivated to have a job that allowed them to violate the law by all ways, shapes, and forms, we had lots of issues managing this workforce, and there are certainly things in my day job now at Morgan Stanley that I don't miss about being the quote unquote queen of the hackers. But those 15 years, you guys can tell how proud I am of all of that. And so leaving government after all of that time, I came to Morgan Stanley as our head of cybersecurity for wealth management with the goal of making sure that every system every network, every application that we field to our 15,000 financial advisors around the country and our 15 million clients around the world, that all of those are as time-tested, battle-hardened, hacker-proofed as possible before we field them in the universe. And so much of what we 
have talked about today, team, resonates with me in terms of the sources of my sleepless nights, in terms of the places where I am encouraging our C-suite to invest, and in terms of the things that I am worried about for all of the customers and clients that I support as their wealth manager. And so, so many layers of this, you guys have me fired up. This is the brave new world that we are living in in 2024. So let me give you a quick sense of my sleepless nights as the head of cybersecurity for a large bank. Top of my list for the last seven years at Morgan Stanley, without a doubt, North Korea. North Korea, of course, up against staunch international sanctions, no domestic economy to speak of, and yet trying to fund a wildly expensive missile and nuclear program. How are they doing this? How is North Korea funding its government in 2024? Any of you who are working with customers, clients, and financial services, small, mid-sized banks, credit unions, all of us are losing sleep over the North Koreans. What are the North Koreans doing? Well, again, they've made it a major plank of their national strategy that they're going to fund their government by hacking into us and stealing money, right? That old adage, why rob banks? It's where the money is. We just never expected to see a nation take this on as the source of their gross domestic product. But that is exactly what North Korea has done. And they have resourced this strategy at a very high level. So estimates now have it at 7,000 people within the North Korean government who have bank hacking as their full-time job. And those ranks just continue to grow. A few years ago, the North Koreans implemented a new national policy whereby every 11-year-old child is administered an aptitude test. You score best and brightest on that North Korean aptitude test, and you are immediately on ramped into the bank hacking program. These kids moved away from their families into dormitories, raised, trained to be bank hackers from the age of 11. Also unfortunate for everyone on this call today who is playing defense, the North Koreans, very, very effective with all of these teenagers. Many of you very familiar with the Bank of Bangladesh heist. A few years ago, the North Korean advanced persistent threat actor known as the Lazarus Group successfully hacks into the Bank of Bangladesh and carts off close to $100 million over a long weekend. But what not everyone knows about this particular heist is that the North Koreans were a typographical error away a spelling mistake away from that being close to a billion dollars. These are non-trivial dollar sums we're talking about here. And in this case, had the North Koreans succeeded in stealing that money, you would have been talking about eight, an eighth of the entire reserves of the nation of Bangladesh gone in a long weekend. What does all of this mean? It means that the customers that we need to support, everyone that we need to protect, needs to be thinking at the highest levels of North Korea as a significant threat actor, so much so that the United Nations has released a report supporting the allegations of 27 countries around the world, all of whom are asserting that the North Koreans have come after some aspect of their central bank over the last two years, all to the tune of more than 3 billion in losses uh, globally. This should terrify you both in your professional capacity and also in your personal capacity. This money all going into their missile and nuclear programs. Now, of course, what am I losing sleep over these last six months? It's certainly North Korea, but let's talk about Iran. You look at the situation in the Middle East and what your customers need to understand is that Iran has a long track record of using cyber means as an asymmetric threat, a mechanism to retaliate for things like economic sanctions, military activity, cyber actions. This is exactly what Iran did between 2012 and 2014. They conducted distributed denial of service attacks, bank to bank to bank, 46 banks in two and a half years, 
all in retaliation for economic sanctions against the Central Bank of Iran, the Iranian oil industry. Your customers need to recognize that the Iranians in the current environment, sailing an aircraft carrier into New York Harbor, a 10-year project, building a nuclear weapon, thank goodness, a very challenging exercise. But putting 40 guys in the basement of a building in Tehran and managing to wreak havoc against American and Western industries, it's a time-tested, well-worn path for our Iranian brethren. Which of course brings us to the main theme of our conversation today. And this is the sea change in cybersecurity that each and every one of your prospects and customers need to be aware of. And that's the idea that five years ago, the vast majority of quote unquote malicious cyber activity on the internet was nation states, right? It would have been Rachel in her NSA capacity. It would have been the British, the Israelis, all of these nation state actors, all acting in the capacity of collecting intelligence and conducting espionage. Now make no mistake, all of that nation state activity is still going on at scale. And with Russia, Ukraine, Iran, Israel, it's going on at a greater scale than ever before. But it is now dwarfed by the volume of malicious cyber activity that is financially motivated and that is criminal in nature. And what that means is that all of your prospects and customers need to view themselves just as Eric said, that this is not a question of if. It's a question of when. It's exactly the point that Bob made, that they have two nickels to rub together. They have data that someone would pay for, and that that means that they need to be focused on protecting that data, being able to be a cyber resilient organization in 2024. And this rise of cyber criminal syndicates has been dramatic over the last few years. Now, 70% of the malicious cyber activity that we see on the internet is, again, criminal in nature and, and financially motivated. It's opportunistic, it's egalitarian. These hackers are not coming after your customers because of who they are. They're coming after them because they are vulnerable. And their backup strategy is crucial to the mitigation of that vulnerability. So let's dive in. My sources of sleepless nights for 2024 are getting pretty diverse. Top of the list, Russia, then ransomware, then as so much discussed today, resilience. Let's start with Russia. Now I talk to people all over the country who are um, focused on all of the wrong things. They don't realize that Putin's cyber army is not in any way, shape or form sitting on the sidelines. They are coming after your customers. They are coming after your prospects and they are very, very happy to blur the line between what is a nation state cyber activity and what is truly criminal in nature. Think about where we were again, just two years ago to be a nation state, to be a cyber actor that was effective in the criminal domain, you needed to be highly trained. You needed to be an engineering degree with a nation state toolkit with years of experience in this space. So many of the hackers we saw were North Koreans, right? Think about those North Koreans. There's no money in North Korean government hacking. Now, they certainly are a well-motivated workforce because we know the consequences of poor job performance in North Korea, but what was the perk? What was the benny to being that North Korean government hacker? It was that you got to take that cyber toolkit home with you nights and weekends and use it for your own personal betterment. And of course, we saw that not just in North Korea, but in Russia, in China, all across Eastern Europe, hackers that worked for their government by day and as hackers for higher nights and weekends. Now, what has changed? The proliferation 
of artificial intelligence, which has dramatically lowered the barrier to entry for cyber actors. Now, who can be a cyber actor? You don't need to be a North Korean government official. You can simply rent a cyber toolkit off of the dark web and watch YouTube videos, the same way our kids learn how to do new things and become a highly effective cyber criminal. That is what our customers and prospects need to understand. Lowering that barrier to entry has increased the scope, the scale, the velocity of cyber actions that we've seen across the board. That certainly has translated into Russian cyber actors, but most importantly for our conversation today, this is crucial in ransomware. Now, we all know that ransomware attacks are the most lucrative form of cyber attack in history. 20 billion in losses just in the United States alone last year. We fully expect to exceed those losses both nationally and globally this year. There is so much that we need to be doing about this space. Now we know, and we talk to our prospects about this, that these, uh, these ransomware attacks are all triple extortion scams, which by which I mean, these hackers are gonna start by getting into your environment, your network. They are going to steal whatever data you value most. Maybe this is customer data, it's employee data, it's proprietary data, it's the models that your customers rely on. It's whatever your customer would be willing to pay to have restored or pay to have not sold on the dark web. Folks, I will tell you, I see this not just with corporate clients. This is institutions, this is universities, houses of worship, endowments, hospitals, nonprofits, churches, synagogues, any entity with data, a potential target. Again, these hackers, opportunistic egalitarian. They get in, they steal what you value, then they come in on a Monday morning, and you've all seen this with your customers and everything's broken, right? Computers are corrupted, backend databases are encrypted, production environment is down, front end website is defaced. For all intents and purposes, that company, that institution, that hospital, that university, that municipality, dead in the water, unable to do business. What happens next? Their CEO, their president receives the first of three very spooky phone calls. Hacker calls and says, hi, happy Monday. You'll see that I am in your environment. I have encrypted all of your systems. If you want your data back, if you want your systems restored, I'm going to need $500,000 in this cryptocurrency equivalent in this South African Bitcoin wallet by two o'clock this afternoon. And if you don't pay, by two o'clock, make it 600,000. We'll keep ratcheting up that ransom until you are willing to pay. Now I can tell you, as someone in the cybersecurity business for 25 years, we never recommend paying a ransom. What happens when you pay a ransom? You have told the world that you are someone who is willing to pay a ransom and the hackers will just keep coming back. City of Baltimore, near and dear to my heart, municipal client of Morgan Stanley has now paid 12 million in taxpayer dollars to have the same data restored by hackers six times. That is the definition of insanity. None of us wanna be in that place. So what do you do? Obviously you wanna have your data backed up. You don't wanna be in a position where you are having to pay that ransom. Now, all too often, I meet with clients who tell me hand over heart, Rachel, our data is backed up. Two weeks later, they're having their cyber bad day. And what do we discover? Oh, the guy who built our backup strategy doesn't work here anymore. Small company. Yeah, he's been gone for four months. Didn't leave us any documentation. All we found in his desk was a copy of Windows for Dummies. That 
is not the position you want your customers and prospects to be. They need a full partner who's going to be with them in the throes of this cybersecurity bad day and allow them to resume their operations. Now, of course, what happens to my unfortunate clients who are not well positioned and have to pay? Well, the hackers then, in many ways, provide like the best customer service some of these clients have ever had. Hackers are on the phone with them, helping them restore their systems, send them the decryption keys, debugging their servers. My clients joke that they, their computers never work better than the day after their ransomware attack. But this is not where we want to be because, of course, the hackers are not done with you. They're going to call back the next day, say it was lovely doing business with you. They will send my clients a customer survey. How was your ransomware experience with us? Why? They are too very, very customer service, reputationally focused. They want our customers to say, yes, I was ransomwareed by the Bulgarians and it was delightful. That is not the position we want our customers and clients to be. They call back the second day. While I was in your environment, I stole all of your data. And if you don't want me to sell it on the dark web, if you don't want me to sell your models to your closest competitor, I'm going to need another $500,000 in that cryptocurrency equivalent. And now I know that you are both willing and able to pay. You are on that sucker list on the dark web of people who are willing to pay a ransom. So maybe, again, sadly, my client pays. The hackers are still not done. Again, remember, these are triple extortion scams. These hackers have figured out what every single one of you knows, which is that you don't want a one-time payment, right? You want a continuous revenue model. You want ransomware as a service? Who knew? But these hackers will then offer you on Wednesday in exchange for a promise, honor amongst thieves, apparently, that you will keep their systems up and running and that they will, will not sell your data on the dark web, they will promise to keep it that way. Now, the brave new world that we're living in means that these hackers are going beyond all of that. This is actually mobile protection money because these hackers know that you are in it for the long haul. And that that means that you are willing, potentially your customer, your client willing to pay in some cases, thousands of dollars a month in exchange for a promise, right? Both that you won't, that the hacker won't sell their data on the dark web, won't um, re-encrypt their databases and their backend systems. And the hackers, again, the kicker, they will agree to help protect this entity from other hacking gangs that want to come in and do the exact same thing. This is the strange, strange place we're living in in 2024, where I can tell you I have hundreds of clients who are paying one Eastern European hacking gang to theoretically protect them from the rest. None of us want to be in this space. What is the solution? Well, of course, it's all the things that we know as IT professionals, that we've got to protect our systems, that we've got to keep all of our systems fully connected and up to date, that we've got to do the right things from a hygiene perspective, employee training, all of the things we know we need to do. But crucial in this are having truly immutable backups where we know that we are going to have the ability to restore. And this is the fatal flaw that I see in so many corporate strategies is that they have not thought through the actual practice, the process of restoring from backups. How long would it truly take them to be able to restore from that key backup situation? They tell me it's going to be hours. They tell me it's going to be days, but they've never actually practiced. And that's what we want to see our clients do more and more is get to a place where they are routinely working 
with a trusted partner in the operational practice of restoring from backups. And when they do that, when they can prove to their board, to their shareholders, to their customer base, that they've pulled the plug, that they know what this would look like, that they are, just as Bob said, viewing their cyber bad day as a when, not an if, and they're ready for when that time comes, that's that nirvana state. It's not putting our heads in the sand and just assuming that everything is going to be okay. It's preparing for the worst and having those systems that practice all in place where everyone understands that role and they know exactly what they're going to do when that day happens. That for me is a huge part of my third R focus in 2024. So much of what Mitch and Eric said around resilience. I know bad things are going to happen. Sometimes they're going to happen because technologists make mistakes, things bump over in the night, natural disasters, humanitarian situations, global war. None of us know what we have in store, but we've got to be prepared in all of those cases. And having truly resilient data storage is at the absolute crux. It is crucial to all of those data security strategies. It is the number one thing I'm focused on this year when I think of all of the things that could go wrong in my world. And I'm so grateful to have been part of this conversation today, truly inspirational and so happy to be part of this, again, really fantastic discussion. Thank you, team. Rachel, thank you for an excellent presentation. As you saw, Rachel clearly pointed out that it's not if you'll be attacked, it's when and how often. Cybersecurity is so important that in the recent Fortune 500 survey, CEOs ranked it as the number two concern, despite the economic and other travails going on in the world today. That's right. The number two concern of Fortune 500 CEOs is cybersecurity. Security analysts estimate that it will cost enterprises $9.5 trillion in 2024. So it's very clear that enterprise cyber storage resilience and recovery needs to be a critical element in your comprehensive cyber security strategy. And Infinidat, with our award-winning InfiniSafe and InfiniSafe Cyber Detection, is there to help you with both your resiliency and rapid recovery. Thank you for listening to Rachel today, and good luck.